the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When uh, the sisters prepare for the Fatima Conference, I always get a phone call sometime in the summer saying, we need to title your your talk. And uh, sometimes I'm at a loss because there are many things I'd like to talk about. And because of that, I hate to give a, a particular title or a particular topic and then be limited to that. Uh, I hate to tell them just call a goulash or or in Minnesota they have this thing called buya, which is a combination of meat and vegetables and what have you. Uh, we're not going to give you buya and we're not going to give you goulash, but we are going to cover things that I think are relevant to our situation today, things that you can leave here and maybe reflect on and maybe help you in the living of your Catholic faith. What I'd like to be do is to begin with a, a little story here. Uh, this past summer, I'd done a lot of traveling. I was visiting one of the uh, mass centers, and this young lady who was going to college came up to me, and she said she wanted to talk to me after mass. I said, that'd be fine. The interesting thing is, as a lot of young people experience when they go to college, is they run into non-Catholics. And sometimes these non-Catholics ask questions that are perhaps things they've never heard of and they're, they're wonder about, well, maybe they have a point there. And this young lady, all that she wanted to know is, what's the answer to this question? It was a particular point in the Old Testament. And this Protestant fella, his interpretation was ridiculous, was absurd. And so I said, well, that's a very interesting point. Let's look it up. So we got out the Old Testament, we use, uh, have fortunate enough at that church, they had Haydock, Father George Haydock's uh, Old and New Testament. That's sold at the center, by the way. Uh, very good because it has nice commentaries. So we look up the exact quote. I gave her an explanation, but I said, hey, let's do this. Let, let's use this as a learning experience. I'm going to go back to the seminary in Omaha and I'm going to look up what the early church fathers taught. Early church fathers meaning those who succeeded after the apostles. The interesting thing is I looked up St. John Chrysostom. There's a ten-volume set that we have at the seminary. And one of the books, to give you an idea, is 900 pages. Very small print. St. John Chrysostom, he writes in Latin on the left column and in Greek on the right column. So I got the right volume and I looked up this exact passage from the Old Testament. Lo and behold, heretics back in the time of St. John Chrysostom's time were teaching the very same thing that this Protestant who happened to stumble on this passage from the Old Testament and came up with the most absurd interpretation, this person here in the year 2009 fell into the same error as these heretics had in the time of St. John Chrysostom in the 300s. That's an amazing thing. <clears throat> so I got the exact passage, photocopied the page. You should have seen the look on that young lady's face. Holy moly. Latin on one side... Greek on the other, and he's, I said, I'm reading to her in Latin. I says, this is exactly what he's saying, and he's cross-referencing this. See in the column? These are the cross-references that he is showing to prove his interpretation is the accurate one. And it, I think a light bulb went on in her head. This is an amazing thing that some over 1,600 years ago, the early church fathers had spoken and interpreted this passage correctly, proved it, 
against the false interpretations of the heretics and that here over a thousand six hundred years later she can use the same passage to defend her faith so I just said listen you don't have to try to translate the Latin because you don't know Latin let me just write out these points for you to look up and show him to and find out for himself he could look these quotes up to say your interpretation is absurd the point I wanted to make is, is that that is the beautiful thing about being a part of the Catholic Church. We have nearly 2,000 years of church teaching. And the consistency is always there. This morning we're going to be speaking about what's called the Proto-Evangelium. The Proto-Evangelium is really the scriptural quote from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. A very important quote from scripture because it is basically the first prophecy announcing the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Redeemer, the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why it's called proto, meaning first, evangelium, meaning gospel. And we need to look at this quote because it will help us better understand the situation of the church today. We have to go all the way to the beginning. Now this quote is, I will put enmity between thee, God is speaking now to Satan, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head. What is the point to be made here is, is that there are Protestants who have in the past tried to accuse the Catholic Church of changing the word, she shall crush thy head. Protestants try to say, no, the quote should be, he shall crush thy head. Not the woman, but the woman's seed. And I would like to just kind of dwell on this because this is a very wonderful thing, a wonderful passage. And when we look at what the early fathers have taught, we'll better understand the real battle that's going on today. I found a very fascinating book. Boy, this is going to be really small. I'm wondering what we can do to make this larger. Is our technician here? Hmm. Make it bigger. I'm not going to be able to hold it that still. Uh, let me do this here. And not very much better. I need a couple of books here. This will really help out. Uh, notebooks or anything. I need to elevate this so I can get a better, a larger picture so I can perhaps see better. Anywhere else? Can you lower that? Uh, I'll raise it up a little bit. And I'm trying to, can we get the whole picture there? You know what? This might possibly be, there we go. Whoa. Okay. Slow it down so we don't get dizzy. Okay. This is, this, that's fine. I think that we'll do fine there. Thank you. A very interesting book that I ran across, and at the time I didn't purchase it because I was already maxed out on my credit card, but I was uh, visiting a bookstore in Stillwater, Minnesota called Looms. And interesting thing about Looms is that they collect many, many traditional books. We get a lot of our Masali Romanums, the Roman Missal that we use at the altar, our breviaries we get from there, Ritualis, Pontificalis. We get many of our seminary books from there. Uh, I believe that uh, the owner had warned his co-workers that when I come, don't let them buy everything out. Because from I can remember it of my first days of going there, and uh, I'd have a breviary say, how much do you want for this? Ten dollars, and I come with fifty of them. Okay, we'll buy all of these here, and we'd kind of wiping them out of their supplies. 
But uh, I had already purchased everything that I needed, but I had a little bit more extra time. And they ran across this book, Ipse, Ipsa, Ipsum. These are the Latin words for he, she, it. This is by R.F. Quigley. I believe that there is a seminary in Chicago named after this gentleman, a very, very educated Catholic scholar. And he is basically arguing against these Protestants about this very point. Try to get this down here. Okay. To make the points at issue perfectly intelligible, I will set down the matter of the dispute. Genesis 3.15, according to the different versions... Protestant version, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall crush thy head, meaning the woman's seed. The Douay version, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and her seed, she shall crush thy head. The Vulgate, written by St. Jerome, in Amicitias Ponum Inter Te et Mulierum, et semen tum et semen ilius ipsa she contret shall crush caputum thy head the whole, this whole text has been called by the early writers of the, in the church the proto gospel for it contains a promise of the future uh, savior now the issue is this this is where the, the difficulty comes in the Hebrew text from which both translations ultimately come is, according to the learned Cardinal Bellarmine, ambiguous. And in consequence, three different readings prevailed among ecclesiastical writers as follows. Ipse, contrat caput, he, Christ, so bruised thy head. Ipsa, contrat caputum, she, the woman, the blessed virgin, through Christ her seed shall crush thy head. Ipsum contrat caputum, it, the seed that is Christ, shall bruise thy head. The bottom line is there is absolutely no difference in sense, to the Catholic mind at least, between these three readings. The learned commentator Cornelius Alapide says, All are true, omnes sunt veri. The Almighty promises that the triumph over Satan is to be complete and his power broken by Christ who is the seed of the woman. The Protestant version adopts ipsum, it, because it thinks it more literally in accord with the true Hebrew reading and, and that of some of the ancient fathers. The Douay version, ipsa, follows the Vulgate, which is sanctioned by almost all the Latin fathers, including such names as St. Augustine, St. Gregory, St. Ambrose, St. Bernard, Victor, Avidus, as well as the Latin translator of St. Chrysostom, Bede, Alacun, and many others the point to be made is, is this if we look at this once again this, this translation I will put enmity between thee and the woman if we could just stop right there almighty God in the very beginning after Adam and Eve had fallen is telling Satan there is a division between thee Satan and the woman that's the division between thy seed, the followers of Satan, both spiritual and visible and invisible, and her seed, which is Christ. And however it be translated, he, she, it, the sense is the same. Satan will be destroyed. The enmity is between Satan and his followers and the Blessed Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ, her Son. Inseparably, we find Jesus and Mary united in this battle against Satan. There is a commentary in the Father George Haydock Bible, the one that he translated and had commentaries on, on this very point of she shall crush. This is the commentary on verse 15. Ipsa, the woman, so diverse are the father of the fathers read this place conformably to the Latin. Others read it ipsum, the seed. 
The sense is the same, for it is by this, her seed, Jesus Christ, that the woman crushes Satan, the serpent's head. The Hebrew text, as Bellarmine observes, is ambiguous. He mentions one copy that had ipsa instead of ipsum, and so it is even printed in the Hebrew interlinary edition of 1572 by Planton under the inspection of Bodorianus. Whether the Jewish editions ought to have more weight with Christians or whether they are all, all these manuscripts conspire against this reading, let others inquire. The fathers who have cited the old Italic version taken from the Septuagint agree with the Vulgate, which is followed by almost all the Latins. And hence we may argue with probability that the Septuagint and the Hebrew formally acknowledge Ipsa, which now moves, indigna with, moves the indignation of Protestants so much so as if we intended by it to have any divine honor to the Blessed Virgin. Part of the difficulty is, is this. When you're dealing with another language, in this case Hebrew, there are some very interesting constructions. And Cornelius Alapid, a scripture scholar, who's a Jesuit priest, he writes this. Wherefore, and this is after reading all the different versions and looking at all the different ins and outs and ups and downs and weighing everything, he says this. Wherefore, it seems to me that Moses in the Hebrew here joined a masculine verb with a feminine pronoun, saying he, the H-I there is a sh with she in Hebrew, askuf, which means shall crush. The askuf in Hebrew is the particular conjugation is for a masculine verb, but it's joined together with a feminine pronoun, she. Now this is not the only place in Scripture where this happens. If you look in the book of Esther, you can look in the book of Ecclesiasticus, uh, there's other areas, the book of Ruth, there's other areas where this, the, in the Hebrew, it's, it does the same thing. She shall crush, to signify that the woman, as well as her seed, and so that the woman, by and through her seed, to it by Christ, should crush the head of the serpent. And to me, this answers a lot of maybe what part of the confusion is. You have scripture writers or interpreters trying to scratch their head. You have a, a, a masculine verb but in front of it is a feminine pronoun. But this is not uncommon, and, and according to Cornelius Alapid, he believes that this was done with a very definite purpose to show that the Blessed Virgin, through her seed, by and through her seed, would crush the head of the serpent. What's also interesting, too, and this is someone who is, I would say, beyond suspicion, there is a Hebrew, uh, a Jewish scholar, that can go, you can look him up in the encyclopedia, Mamonides. He wrote in 1135, this is where he lived from 1135 to 1204, and according to the encyclopedia Britannica, he is one of the greatest theologians and philosophers the Jews have ever produced. His greatest and most learned work and was entitled The Guide to the Perplexed in Hebrew. And this was written in Arabic and translated into Hebrew by himself. The interesting thing is this Jewish scholar, who's not a Christian, doesn't recognize Christ as the Messiah, so, you know, he's not like he's trying to change words to benefit, you know, the Catholic Church or anything. In this work, Maimonides reads the Hebrew, He, Ipsa, she, she shall crush the head. Very, very interesting. Hoc est dic, quo dictum est ipsa contra capitum. This is what is said. She shall crush thy head. What's also interesting, too, is that the heretic John Wycliffe, long before the Catholic Church pronounced through Pope Pius the Ninth, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, long before that, the heretic John Wycliffe translated, She shall tread thy head. 
very interesting, the word she. But my point is, is this. When we look to the early church, what a beautiful thing we have as Catholics, that we can look to the early church and say, okay, they received the faith right from the apostles. Jesus told his apostles, go teach all nations, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And the early church, the early church fathers, they received the faith either directly or one generation away from the time of the apostles. And that's what we call sacred tradition. We have as the two sources of divine revelation, scripture and tradition. And of the two, tradition helps support scripture. And you might ask, well, how is that? It's because if we look at the early writings of the early Christians, the fathers of the church and the apologists who defended the faith, they frequently quote from sacred scripture, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts of the Apostles so that when we think of scripture and we try to demonstrate the three aspects, the veracity its truthfulness, its authenticity that those who are attributed to have writing have written Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and the Acts of the Apostles and finally integrity that no one added or took away from these sacred writings to prove veracity, integrity and authenticity we go to the early fathers of the church and say, okay, they quoted from Scripture. And if we take all these these different early fathers of the church who received the faith from the apostles or one generation removed, they are very, very clear when they quote Scripture. If you take all their scriptural quotes, we could basically find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Acts of the Apostles contained in their writings. Very interestingly, we have some of the early fathers quoting the Gospels 9,000 times, 10,000 times, 6,000 times. That's how many times they quote from the New Testament. And gathering all their different quotes from the the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts of the Apostles, we have substantially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John there in the writings of the early fathers of the church. So much so that with infallible surety, the Holy Ghost protecting the church, Pope Damasus the first Pope Damasus the first gave the canon of sacred scripture saying these are the authentic books of the Old Testament these are the authentic books of the New Testament all together 72 books 45 in the Old Testament 27 in the New Testament these are the authentic books and just something for you to consider not a part of the topic but just a little addendum and that is What's very interesting is we look at the oldest Bibles in the, in, in the world today that back, date all the way back to those early days. They have all the books that our Catholic Bible has today. Not only that, but if you take the early Christian writers, the earliest Christian writers, they quote from these books that the Pro- Protestants accuse us of having added. Oh, those are not authentic books. You have more books maybe some Pope snuck those in there you know just to make it look good that's absolutely absurd no Pope snuck those in there those books go from the very beginning the early fathers of the church quoted and recognized those books as being divinely inspired the early church used those books if you want to know something there's a man by the name of Luther he protested he was the first Protestant he took those books out okay But that's the point to be made. We also look, and getting back to the topic of our Blessed Mother, we have the early Greek fathers describing adjectives describing the Blessed Virgin Mary. What is beautiful is what we as Catholics believe and we find in sacred scripture is confirmed by the early church. These are the adjectives in in Greek that they describe the Blessed Virgin. Pure, chaste, unsullied, without blemish, without disgrace, without spot or stain, without corruption or defilement, without uncleanliness, without harm and destruction, without smear, besmirchment, without dishonor, without disgrace, without injury, without harm. And then they add to these adjectives in the superlative. 
most pure, most chaste, exceedingly without any blemish, exceedingly without any smear, exceedingly without any harm, exceedingly without any spot. Why did they write this way? They who received the faith directly from the apostles, these early fathers of the church, knew that it's divinely revealed by God that the Blessed Virgin, she is the one that God set at enmity with Satan. Never at any moment would Satan have any victory over this woman, this woman who would crush Satan's head. What's beautiful about this, getting back to the Proto-Evangelium, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. What's really beautiful about all this is that Pope Pius IX, when he proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, and also Pope Pius XII, the dogma of the Assumption. Immaculate Conception, 1854, Assumption, 1950, giving the arguments and, and, and the proof for the Immaculate Conception, for the Assumption of Our Lady, among the proof is this proto-evangelium where God set this enmity between Satan and the woman and the conquering of Satan by the virgin, by the, the woman, through her seed. Also going into the early church, these are very some very interesting things, but early, early, early on, we have Origen speaking about Our Lady. Elizabeth, Elizabeth prophesies before... John, Mary prophesies before the Savior's birth. And as sin began from a woman and then came to man, so too the beginning of salvation had its origin from a woman. And we also have, now it was year 100, we have St. Gregory. Because the first virgin Eve fell, seduced by Satan, Gabriel brought his, me brought his message to the virgin Mary that one, the one virgin might answer to the other, and the birth might answer to birth. Deceived by flatteries, Eve gave birth to words of death. Mary, receiving the angel's message, gave birth to the incarnate word, the word of life. In consequence of the words of Eve, Adam was driven from paradise, and the word that was born of Mary revealed the cross by which the thief entered into Adam's paradise. We can show you, we're not going to cover all the quotes, but just a few of them, interestingly. Tertullian, another early writer, around 100 A.D. It was while Eve was yet a virgin that the word crept in, which was the framer of death. Into a virgin in like manner must be introduced the word of God, who was the builder of, up of life, so that by the same sex, whence had come our ruin might come also our recovery to salvation. Eve had believed the serpent, Mary believed the angel Gabriel. The fault which one committed by believing, the other by believing blotted out. We also have St. Ephraim, year 300, Verily indeed, thou and thy mother, uh, I see it on the screen here, but it's not up here. Verily indeed, thou and thy mother are alone in being in every respect altogether beautiful. For in thee, O Lord, there is no spot, nor is there any stain in thy mother. And we also have St. Justin Martyr. The year 155. The firstborn of the Father is born of the Virgin in order that the disobedience caused by the serpent might be destroyed in the same manner in which it had originated. For Eve, an undefiled virgin, conceived the word of the serpent and brought forth disobedience and death. But the Virgin Mary, filled with faith and joy, when the angel Gabriel announced to her the good tidings, that the Spirit of the Lord should come upon her and the power of the highest would overshadow her, and therefore the Holy One to be born of her, would be the Son of God answered, Be it done unto me according to thy word. And indeed she gave birth to him concerning whom we have shown so many passages from Scripture were written, and by whom God destroys both the serpent and those angels and men 
who become like the serpent, but frees from death those who repent of their sins and believe in Christ. This is from Origen. St. Irenaeus. Now, St. Irenaeus, this is a cherka around 202 A.D. He was a disciple of St. Polycarp. St. Polycarp was the disciple of St. John the Evangelist. The knot of Eve's disobedience obtained its unloosening through the obedience of Mary. For that which the Eve, a virgin, bound by her unbelief, Mary, a virgin, unbound by her faith. And like I say, we can go on and on and on. Many of these things repeatedly show that Mary is indeed the, the woman spoken of in this Proto-Evangelium Genesis 3.15 and also demonstrate her immaculate conception that never would Satan have a victory over this woman who was to conquer him. St. Hippolytus in 3.35, or 2.35, excuse me, the ark which was made of incorruptible timber was the Savior. The ark symbolized the tabernacle of his body, which was impervious, impervious to decay and engendered no sinful corruption. The Lord was sinless because in his humanity he was fashioned out of incorruptible wood, that is, out of the Virgin and the Holy Ghost, lying within without as with the purest gold of the Word of God. Well, finally, we have St. Augustine here in St. Ambrose. St. Augustine, with the exception of the Holy Virgin Mary, touching whom, out of respect to the, our Lord, when we are on the subject of sins, I have no mind to entertain the question. For how are we to know what greater degree of grace was conferred in order to vanquish sin in every respect? Upon her who merited to conceive and bring forth him whom all allow to have had no sin. With the exception of this virgin, if it was in our power to bring together into one place all the saints, men and women, when they lived here, and ask them whether they were without sin, what are we to suppose where they have answered? That which this man Pelagius says, or that which John the Apostle said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And St. Ambrose, a virgin by grace entirely free from any stain of sin. The reason why I wanted to talk about this topic is, is this. The bottom line, some people believe or perhaps live by the idea that Yes, there's divisions in the world. We have the conservatives versus the liberals. And that is a division, but it's not the ultimate division. There's then you got the Republicans against the Democrats, and you got those who are are in one camp or another camp. But really, when it gets down to the bottom line, the fight, the battle, the enmity is between Satan and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And when you look at even in recent history, you'll find that whenever Satan is about to try some major move to lead mankind away from God, there the Blessed Virgin Mary is working also. We could look at the, the Masons' work in France from the French Revolution and thereafter, all the evils that came upon France and, and came upon Europe. And during that time, our Blessed Mother was appearing. We especially think of around the time of the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, how in 1854, Pope Pius IX proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. This is at a time in which the Masons were attacking the papacy itself. And in the midst of all these trials in the church, the Pope proclaims Mary's Immaculate Conception, which had been held from the very beginning in the church, but he proclaimed it infallibly as being revealed by God, so it was of divine and Catholic faith. And then Our Lady appears in 1858 to Bernadette Subaru, a simple peasant girl. And when the girl was asked to ask the lady, what is her name? Our Blessed Mother looked up to heaven, lowered her eyes, crossed her hands over her breast and said, I am the Immaculate Conception. We look at when Our Lady appeared at Fatima. This is on the very verge when 
the revolutionaries are going to overthrow Tsar Nicholas II, gain control over Russia, and make Russia a communist country. Our Blessed Mother is appearing to these Fatima children, telling them the remedy for what's about to happen. Mankind must amend. It must cease offending God who is already too much offended. War is a punishment for sin. So many go, souls go to hell for sins of the flesh. Certain styles and fashions will be introduced that gravely offend her divine son. This is in 1917. Russia will spread her errors. And sure enough, we have the Red October, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And by November of 1917, Russia is now under communist rule. And the thing is, is that when we look at the whole course of the history of the church, we see Satan and the woman, this battle going back and forth. We, all, we know ultimately Satan, no matter what inroads he makes, whatever victories he seems to make in, 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 in the midst of, of the world, leading people away from God, we know that ultimately Satan's defeated. But I would like to take from here and go a little bit further. And that is, when we think of the situation of the church today, we've talked about this many, many, many times. But I, I would like to reiterate something that never ceases to amaze me. And that is the ingenuity, the ingenuity that was to orchestrate the changes in the church. When I look at the changes that have occurred since Vatican Council II, it is beyond human ingenuity to know human nature and to know exactly where to strike, where to say this, where to say that, how to orchestrate this, what I have no doubt in my mind is what we call the great apostasy, the great falling away. When we look at the changes in the church, and we, we're going to only touch upon a few, we see Satan's supernatural wisdom, knowing man's fallen human nature, leading little by little, by increments, to the destruction of the mass and the destruction of the faith. What I did is, we have a book, uh, we have a, a place in Omaha at the seminary called the Hell Room. And the Hell Room has all the books that seminarians are not supposed to read. And uh, But we, from time to time we pull them out, we let them take a look at them as necessary to help to bring across a point. But here I photocopied. This is from 1964. Sorry that this is a little bit on the big side, but uh, that'll work. That's good. This is right out of the Roman Missal for 1964. This is for the feast Festa Octobris, and it has... Beate Maria Virginis a Rosario, second class feast. But look at this. This is right out of what would be used on the altar. Let us all rejoice in the Lord, celebrating a feast in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary, for whose solemnity the angels rejoice and join in praising the Son of God. My heart overflows with a, a goodly theme as I sing my ode to the King. Glory be to the Father, etc. Then, we have the another uh, introit. This is an votive mass, meaning if outside of the feast of October 7th, if somebody wanted to, throughout the year, on a feria, offer the mass, then he would say, Hail, Holy Mother, who gave birth to the king. The translation is good, but then it has the oration. Deus cuius unigenitus per vita, mortem et resurrectionem sum, nobis salutis eterni premia paravit. It has it in Latin. Commemoration of St. Mark. Gregem tuum pastere terne. Then it gets into the gradual. And, or the, I should say, the epistle. A reading from the book of Proverbs. The Lord begot me, the firstborn of his ways, etc. 
and then the gradual was once again in English. Because of truth and mercy and for the sake of justice, may your right hand show you wondrous deeds, etc. Alleluia, alleluia. Then we get to the next page. This is the, all the proper for this feast of the Holy Rosary. But the interesting thing is it's Latin and English. Can I point to anything right here and say heresy? Can I point to anything and say that's intrinsically evil? No. I mean, it's wrong to translate from Latin to the vernacular. As the popes have said, there's a reason why we do things in Latin. It's a universal language. It's used throughout the world. And Latin is a dead language. There can't be any... You don't worry about words because the words don't change the meaning. They're not evolving or developing in a different, a different sense. But this is extremely clever because a priest who is in a parish and trying to make sure that he's providing the Mass and sacraments for his people and, and the parish I grew up with, uh, grew up in, in in Chicago, I think we had 500 families. Not, not people, 500 families. I believe there was five or six Masses on Sunday. We have a, an enrollment in our school of over a thousand kids. And that was only going up to eighth grade. Things were very, very busy. They had, we had three priests hearing confessions on Saturdays, and uh, we had Mass at seven, eight thirty, ten, eleven thirty, twelve thirty, and then they also even had an evening Mass. And the parking lot was packed all the time. So you get a priest who's very, very busy, very active, and you throw something like this in there with the excuse, we want the people to understand what's going on. Now that might sound pretty good, but we know that that was not their intention. This was a stepping stone to the Novus Ordo. And so they come up with something that, you know, you really can't put your finger on anything bad other than they translated some of it into English, which should not be done as popes have spoken of in the past, but to a, an average priest in a parish who's extremely busy, okay, I'm not going to make a big deal. I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to do it. And because if he says, no, I'm not going to do it, the bishop's going to say, what's the problem? Show me where this is wrong. It would be very difficult to try to, to, to negotiate or argue on that. And then they came up with the idea, let's, let's have an, instead of a, an altar, let's have a table. You know, the people can see the different things a priest does now. Isn't that a great idea? You can see, you know, you got the back to the priest, and the priest is doing some very sacred things there, and it would be nice if everybody could see it. But the modernist knew exactly what they were going to do. You don't show all your cards you get the idea of we got to change. We're going to make excuses for these changes that are going to sound reasonable. Nobody's going to be able to argue these things. But we're going to be doing away with all this shortly. This is just a stepping stone, stepping stone to the Novus Ordo. Now that is clever. That is extremely clever. I remember Abbot Leonard Giardina from Alabama. He came here. And at that time above the sacristy we had a lot of breviaries, etc. And I, I told him, you know, we have these monastic breviaries. We pray the Roman breviary, but there's a monastic breviary that monks pray. I said, you could take these breviaries because we, we have no use for them. So Abbot Leonard's kind of going through and he says, aha. He pulls one of these breviaries out and he says, this is it. He said, and it was like 1960 or 61. He said, how clever these modernists were. This breviary, all that it did, didn't change anything except it rearranged the prayers. Instead of praying it in front, we're going to pray it in back, or we're going to pray this in the middle. Now, what was the purpose behind that? It didn't matter what they did by introducing this quote-unquote slight change that they made obsolete all the books prior to that. 
so that you now had to have this book that had the prayers in this order. But could you point and say any one of these rearrangings was wrong in itself? Very hard to prove that. But that was their excuse because they were going to go from here to a complete modernization. Now we get to the Novus Ordo. 1969, the Novus Ordo comes out, the all-English mass, even the canon is in English. And we stop and weigh the change of the words of consecration from many which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins to for you and for all men so that sins may be forgiven. That is extremely clever. The average person out there, average lay person is going to say, hmm, yeah, Christ did die for all men. There's no problem with that. But we know as we've talked about we've talked about this so often in the past whereas Christ's death on the cross was sufficient to save all men efficaciously not all men benefit from the graces that our Lord merited and that's the reason why Jesus Christ at the last supper said in Hebrew sagian many not all, but many. And that's the reason why the Council of the Catechism of the Council of Trent said, with reason were the words for all not used. And St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa says, not all, it has to be many. And that's the reason why this very particular point was raised by a Dominican theologian, Cajetan, talking about not the for many and the for all, but that just the words, this is my body, this is my blood is enough. And Pope St. Pius V said, you have, to ex- you have to expurge that from your writings. You can't say that. But my point is, is that what a clever innovation. The average person is not going to have the smarts, the theological intelligence to know the difference. I mean, yeah, we know many and all, but... It's, it's, it'd be hard for a, an average layperson to comprehend that. With what diabolic ingenuity they changed the words for for all. They're not stupid. They're very, very clever. And to make matters worse, we know that if we look at from start to finish, it wasn't just the words for many to for all. That's not the only change. Any reference to a propitiatory sacrifice was taken out of the Mass. So you have this this really bare bones structure of a liturgy that has nothing pertaining to the sacrifice of the Mass to atone for sin. And, I mean, there's a semblance. You have a, a, a simple, I will go into the altar of God, or peace be with you, or, you know, some type of greeting and then a very brief confession, and maybe a curie. They stuck, they kept the glory in, but anything that pertains to atonement for, to, for sin and the Mass is taken out. But that was, like I say, a very clever way how they engineered all this. We can look at the changes that subsequently happened. The priest always keeps his fingers together after the consecration. There's particles on his finger. Why? Because... You keep your fingers together so that you're not losing those particles. You don't separate your fingers so your your fingers are purified with wine and water and you wipe them. Mass is offered over a corporal. When we distribute communion, we have a patent because we want to be very careful about particles, about the Blessed Sacrament, because Christ is, in, is contained whole and entire in every portion of the sacred species. But where they started and where they ended up, where are we at right now? It is a fiasco. What did they do? They they said the priest doesn't have to have his fingers together anymore. People can stand for communion. The Novus Ordo omits many of the genuflections. And all this is de-emphasizing the real presence of Christ on the altar. And not only that, but now you have Eucharistic ministers, men and women who distribute communion. You have communion in the hand. There's no patent. What about 
the sacred species? What about Christ being present in every particle? Yes, it's totally out the window. And is it any wonder why people have lost the concept of the real presence of Christ? It's simply because the way it is now, everything they've done has de-emphasized the presence of Christ. And they can technically speak and say, no, we don't deny Christ is present. Practically, they do. You admit all these genuflections, you stand for communion, you get communion in the hand. The tabernacle in many churches has been removed or set off to the side. It's man facing man. And it's no longer the priest acting in the person of Christ. It's now Father so-and-so and his personality, his his dynamics. And there's a little bit of a... They can, incul, they can enculturate into their quote-unquote liturgy, their mass, supposedly, the most bizarre things. We've talked about this before. I, I, it, it, it's it, it, nothing surprising me anymore. We had one priest, uh, Vatican II priest in Omaha. He got transferred from one parish where he was very popular in a school to another parish. And he was so hurt by having to leave his students, these school kids behind it, he did a cartwheel from the pulpit back to the table with his vestments on. This was in a newspaper in Omaha, World Herald, and it said uh, when he got to the new parish, he said, hey, we heard you did a cartwheel. Are going to give it up for us? Sure enough, he did. Did a cartwheel in his sanctuary to his vestments on. And oh, wasn't that so cute? You know, no matter how or where you travel, especially in some of these areas, rural areas where there's a lot of people who settle, like the Czech people or the Polish people or whatever, polka masses. We're going to have a polka mass to celebrate this anniversary of the church or whatever. we got mariachi masses. We also have what they call liturgical dancing. Liturgical dancing. And there was an a, a article in the diocesan paper in Omaha defending the use of liturgical dancing at papal masses. When John Paul II was having mass, they'd, they'd have these women dancing around the altar. In fact, I got a catalog. You know, religious stores send us catalogs because they just look up on the internet or whoever, oh, your church, we're sending you a catalog. <laughs> they had a catalog on outfits for women to wear for liturgical dancing. Believe you me, I had enough just looking at the cover. I just threw the whole thing away. So I'm not going to even look at this. This is this is not even modest. Besides the fact it is so out of place, it is so inappropriate. You're focusing on this woman and whatever gesture she's making, and not on prayer, uplifting your heart, mind, and soul to God. And that's the the sad thing about the Novus Ordo. This quote unquote so much participation, stand up, sit down, shake hands, you know, so much participation. There's no time really to pray. Because you're so busy, you're so active doing this, that, and everything else like that, listening to the music, or listening to the choir, or clapping, or watching Father So and so entertain you, that this idea of worshiping God and to focus on Christ on the altar and the blessed sacrament, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, totally out the window. Now, it's also interesting, too, how clever they are in everything they've done. And I, I believe that it's inspired by Satan. No doubt in my mind about that. Another example of this, we could cover something that's pretty recent, and that is with regard to the widespread use of the what, quote unquote Latin Mass now. You know, the news media is going to take this and run with it and say, oh boy, he's a real conservative. He's going to bring it, really bring it back. Well, he's been around for some time now, a couple of years now. And is the Nova Sordo still there? You betcha. Absolutely. The Nova Sordo's not going anywhere. This fiasco of the Nova Sordo is the ordinary form of of the modern church's mass. So when Benedict XVI was going to talk about the Latin mass coming out, he waited and waited and waited and waited and everybody's speculating, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. 
And he's reassuring the Vatican II bishops. Talking about, don't worry about it. He's telling him, in the first place, there is the fear that the document detracts from the authority of the Second Vatican Council, one of whose essential decisions, the liturgical reform, is being called into question. This fear is unfounded. In this regard, it must first be said that the missal published by Paul VI and then republished in two subsequent editions by John Paul II obviously is and continues to be the normal form, the forma ordinaria of the Eucharistic liturgy. Don't worry about the Novus Soto going away. It's not going anywhere. It's staying right where it's at. The last version of the Missali Romanum prior to the council, which was published with the authority of Pope John XXIII in 1962 and used during the council, will now be able to be used as the forma extraordinaria of the liturgical celebration. It is not appropriate to speak of these two versions of the Roman Missal as if they were two rites. Rather, it is a matter of a twofold use of one and the same rite. You know, I, I, I didn't touch upon this. I omitted to do this. But when we think of this issue of the changes in the, of the church, we go back to John the 23rd. How did it all start? A really simple thing. He added the name Joseph to the canon of the Missal. Now, hey, you going to argue about that? You don't like St. Joseph or something? I mean, what are you going to do about it? So, okay, you look, we have still, when you get to the canon of the Mass, they got this thing taped up at the bottom of the page in an arrow going down to where he's supposed to, you know, insert St. Joseph's name in the canon, just going back to, you know, John the 23rd. But it was just a stepping stone, just an excuse. We're going to put Joseph in the canon. You know, this was pre- introduced back in the time of St. Pius X, and it was, they, Refused, they said, "No, I'm not going to break the canon. The canon means fixed. It's this the way it is." And there was a reason why they did that. But it was just that little change for the sake of change. And then once again, let's add to the vernacular in '64. And then, if I'm not mistaken, I think when I made my first Holy Communion in 1966, everything was in English except for the canon of the Mass. But the point is, they were subtle. They were clever, and the devil knows human nature. He knows, say this, say it this way, present it that way. People are going to swallow hook, line, and sinker, and so will the priests. And then we'll have the coup d'etat. We're going to have the final blow and destroy the mass. This is the case in every single thing that you look at that pertains to the changes in the church. Give you another example here. This is with regard to the new code of canon law, 1983. Catholic ministers may lawfully administer the sacraments only to Catholic members of Christ's faithful, who equally may lawfully receive them only from Catholic ministers, except as provided in two, three, four of this canon, and in Canon 861, number two. Whenever necessity requires or a genuine spiritual honor recommends it, general a genuine spiritual advantage recommends it, and provided the danger of error and differentism is, invo- is avoided, Christ faithful for whom it is physically or morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister may lawfully receive the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, anointing the sick from a non-Catholic minister in whose churches these sacraments are valid. The problem is is this. The Catholic Church, prior to Vatican II, gave only one exception. In danger of death, any priest who is validly ordained can absolve you from sin, and the Church at that moment will provide for the listeners, the lawfulness of that, in danger of death, so that you can have your sins forgiven. End of the discussion. That was the one and only exception. The idea says, well, spiritual advantage, genuine necessity. 
you know, you're opening the door to everything and anything. I'll go here because I want to. I feel help me spiritually. I'll go. I'll go to these schismatics over here, or whether they're Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, old Catholics. I'm going to go wherever I want because there's a spiritual advantage. Provided the danger of error or indifferentism is avoided. How in the world can you avoid indifferentism? The idea that one religion is as good as another, one church is as good as another, they're all good and praiseworthy. How do you avoid that when you're telling the faithful, you go anywhere you want? Go anywhere you want for the sacraments. Of what? The Eucharist, confession, the anointing of the sick. Now, in the case of penance, like I say, in danger of death, you can get absolution from someone. This is not danger of death. This is, hey, if you think it's going to spiritually be advantageous to you, go ahead. Now it goes a little bit further. <clears throat> Catholic ministers may lawfully administer the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick to members of the Eastern Church is not in full communion with the Catholic Church. These are schismatics if they spontaneously ask for them and are properly disposed. The same applies to members of other churches, which the Apostolic See judges to be in the same position as the efforts at Eastern churches insofar as the sacraments are concerned. Now, this canon continues. So talking about schismatics. Now let's talk about the Protestants. If there is a danger of death or in the judgment of the diocesan bishop or the Episcopal Conference, there is some other grave and pressing need Catholic ministers may lawfully administer these same sacraments to other Christians not in full communion with the Catholic Church who cannot approach a minister of their own community and who spontaneously ask for them provided they demonstrate the Catholic faith in respect to these sacraments and are properly disposed. The point to be made is, is this. The Catholic Church forbids Ministers, Catholic ministers, to administer the sacraments to heretics and schismatics. It's forbidden, even if they ask for them in good faith, unless they are reconciled to the church ahead of time. Now, it could happen that I'm driving down the road and there's an accident and somebody's dying there. I have no idea who this person is. I don't know if they're Catholic. I don't know if they're baptized. I don't know anything about them. The church says that I could conditionally give them absolution in the event that a number of things are verified. If they're baptized, if they're sorry for their sins, if they're in good faith, whatever. If they're invincibly ignorant, there's, there's so many conditions there, you can't possibly think of all these things. But the point is, the priest says in his mind, see Kapok says, if you are capable, ego te absolvo, then you can absolve them for their sins because those are only conditions that God knows. But the point to be made is, is this. You know, they put these caveats in there. Oh, you know, what are the caveats? Well, they, they can't get to a minister, their own minister. They, they're spontaneously asking. They say they believe in that sacrament. So go ahead and give them the sacraments. But then, not shortly after this, this was in 1983, a little bit later on, I believe it was in the early 90s, John Paul II said, yeah, we'll extend this now to mixed marriages. So when a Catholic marries a Protestant, Eucharistic sharing on the part of the Protestants possible. That is preposterous. That is saying, you know, you don't have to be a Catholic. Be anything you want. You get the Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist you can only receive if you're a member of the, of the Catholic Church. You can't give it to heretics and schismatics. You can't. Never been done. Can't be done. And yet we know that this is how they slowly but surely did this. They say, oh, don't look, be careful about indifferentism. And, and you can't do this indiscriminately. And it goes from this to this to this to this. And before you know it, there are no rules. I was getting a, a, a haircut at a barber shop. I think he told this some conferences ago. The barber knows they offer the Latin mass down the road. <clears throat> He's oh, he said this one raise your eyebrows. He said uh, he was at a wedding, and I believe it was the Bishop of St. Paul, Minnesota. 
he was con celebrating a marriage with a Protestant a Protestant minister, a woman minister. And so he got the Catholic and you have the Protestant and they both, quote unquote, received the vows of this couple. But he said at the communion, the bishop gave the Protestant minister that woman communion. What what is all this all about? There's no difference. They all belong to the same church as far as they're concerned. There's no difference between the one true church of Christ and these Protestant churches or all these other churches because that is the fruit of ecumenism, false ecumenism. It's based on the erroneous belief that all churches, all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy. They're all trying to do something right. And yet we know the Catholic Church has always taught God is revealed through Jesus Christ, the one true religion. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, founded one church, and that's the Catholic Church. Now, when I look at how cleverly they did these things, once again I say the devil. Satan knows human nature. He knows how to water these things down. He knows how to start something and, and put all these warnings and be careful about this and be careful about that. And before you know it, they're way out in left field. They're not even in a ballpark. They're all right out of the church. Another example here. This is with regard to ecumenism. The idea of worshiping with other religions, worshiping with other churches, I should say. The point to be made is, is this. This is in 1964, and so they had not to show all their cards. I want to be very, very careful about this because there's still some conservative bishops and cardinals who know what the Catholic faith is like. So we want to be really careful about not just saying what happened after Vatican II where just, just about anything and everything goes. John Paul II calls all these religions of the world together at Assisi to worship their false gods, pray to their false gods for world peace. What is he saying? That your prayers are beneficial. Pray, you Hindus, pray to your Hindu gods. Please. So there might be world peace. Pray to your Hindu gods. And all these other religions of the world. No, that's the reason why the Catholic Church condemned this. Pope Pius XI, in 1928, when this very ecumenical movement was trying to get started, Pope Pius XI condemned it, saying it's tantamount to apostasy, a great, the great falling away. He says those who promote ecumenism, it's tantamount to abandoning the religion revealed by God, and this is the error, the prominent error of Vatican II, false ecumenism, condemned by Pope Pius the 11th and Mortali Manimos, condemned by Pope Pius the 9th in the Syllabus of Error, and also forbidden by Canon 1258, forbids Catholics to worship with other churches, other religions. It's forbidden. It's a sin against faith. Okay, what do they, how do they how do they start this all out? As for common worship, however, it may not be regarded as a means to be used indiscriminately. So you might have some conservative Novus Ordo. Yeah, you see that. They're not obeying the, the documents of Vatican II. You can't do it indiscriminately. You can't do it at all. So it makes it sound, oh, hey, hey, indiscriminately. For the restoration of the unity of Christians. Such worship depends chiefly on two principles. It should signify the unity of the church. It should provide a sharing in the means of grace. Now, I'd like to say this about the sharing in the means of grace could you clarify that? Are you talking about Catholics, their prayers and their good examples sharing graces with these non-Catholics? Or is it mutual? We're, I'm, we're going to get graces from you non-Catholics and you non-Catholics are going to get graces from us. We're all good graces helping each other out. It doesn't say anything about that. The fact that it should signify unity generally rules out common worship, yet the gaining of a needed grace sometimes recommends it or commends it. So it's saying, hey, don't do it indiscriminately. Depends on two principles. Because of the first principle, it generally rules it out, but go ahead and do it anyway. That is amazing, uh, an amazing masterpiece 
of of ambiguity and also wiggling its way out to saying, go ahead and break the first commandment. Go ahead and go against what the Catholic Church taught in the past. Go ahead and worship with these other churches, with these other religions. We have another area that we can get into, but I'm looking at my watch here. It's 12.15, and Sister wanted me to... I got four minutes. Hmm. This is good. Yeah, this next section, Sister, is going to go longer than that, but I'll end on this one quote here before we go to part two. This is from Pope Leo XIII, Satis Cognitum, 1896. There can be nothing more dangerous than those heretics who admit nearly the whole series of doctrine, and yet by one word, as with a drop of poison, taint the real and simple faith taught by our Lord and handed down by apostolic tradition. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I, I, I saw John Paul II, he had a rosary in his hand. And Benedict, you know, he was kneeling there and his hands were folded so piously. Don't tell me he's not the Pope. And, and you know, he's trying. He wants to get back to Latin Mass. And he got all these evil men surrounding him when he, his hands are tied. He just, he just can't help it. Well, the point to be made is, is this. We know the Catholic Church, the true Church of Christ, is infallible. It cannot err. It cannot err on matters of faith and morals when teaching the universal church. The Pope is infallible when he speaks ex cathedra. The totality of bishops are infallible either in a general council or when scattered throughout the whole world, they teach in union with the Pope in matters of faith and morals. There's two objects of the infallibility of the church, sacred scripture and tradition, and also the secondary object are those things closely associated with divine revelation, which would be the mass, the sacraments, the liturgy, the universal laws of the church, because practically speaking, when the church legislates a law universally for the entire church saying one thing. Number one, this law is consistent with the teachings of Christ. There's nothing contrary to faith and morals. And number two, you are bound to follow it. Christ said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. We cannot have the Catholic Church consistently talking, teaching, consistently the same faith, same faith, same teachings, for nearly 2,000 years, and then slam on the brakes, ecumenism, which was condemned, is now promoted. Religious liberty, religious freedom, was condemned, explicitly condemned, in 1863, and 1960, excuse me, 1864, condemned in syllabus of error, and now in 1965, 101 years later, the very thing that was condemned is now being promoted as this is the way it is. The Mass was very, very clearly defined as a sacrifice, a propitiatory sacrifice. Luther, his teachings on the Mass were condemned. He was the first Protestant who came up with this notion of a meal, uh, the commemoration of the Lord, but not a sacrifice. The very thing that Luther did is the very thing that the Novus Ordo uh, did in, its, in, in, in essence they defined it with Luther's definition of what the mass how according to Luther it defined it they stripped out everything of sacrifice of the mass the point is something went wrong in, 19, in the 1960s with Vatican II and we're going to continue on with this We've got a couple more things that we have to cover but the point to be made is this Satan is clever, very clever. He knows exactly what to say, how to say it, when to say it, and that's the reason why so many people have been led astray. And as the enemies of the church, Satan's seed, as they had plotted 
long ago to destroy the church from within. They said, leave the older generations behind. Forget them. They're set in their ways. Leave them behind. Go to youth. Go to the seminaries and convents and sacristies and infiltrate there and get in with the younger people. Sooner or later, we'll get our own man in position to completely destroy the church from within. Is that four minutes? Okay. 